Welcome to D-Lab Electronics everybody. Today on the bench I have a Johnson Navigator as well as a CAT. The Navigator has a report of low power output and the vernier dial is very stiff to tune. So let's see what can be done about it. So if you look close at this Navigator you'll see that the meter, now you can see it, the meter is incorrect. So somebody has changed out the meter with one out of a 6 and 2 transmitter and I noticed that the shunts were still scaled for the original meter. So that may be part of the problem. The other issue I found, I'll turn this thing around, is the meter switch itself is not the correct type. Should be a three pole switch installed is a double pole double throw part of the meter switching on the navigator actually routed some bias for the transmitter to operate well that's not there we'll take a close look here and i'll show you what my plan is so when the meter is installed they also put in this double pole double throw switch it should be a three pole like this one so i found this online it is a US made old stock switch. So the plan is you have to pull the front panel and get this one mounted up and then rewire the meter. So really the timing's pretty good. As I repair the meter switch, we can also take the vernier out and clean and lube it. Get it all taken care of, huh buddy? And of course my new helper is pretty interested in that switch. He's like, I would just love to knock this on the floor so you can pick it up and put it back up here so I can knock back on the floor. That's what these guys do to me all day long. There's your toy. So the VFO dial on the navigator is really tight. I don't even want to turn it because I don't want to damage it any further. So the next step, we'll pull the face off of this guy and inspect it and see what we can do. So removing the face on the navigator is not too bad of a job. Of course you have to take all the knobs off, there's some nuts behind those, the wiring to the meter, but the most critical part is uncoupling the vernier drive. So back here, if you look down, you see that big brass assembly? That's the vernier. There is a set screw that's up inside of the VFO. There's an access hole, I'll show you that in a minute. If you take the hardware off this face and try to pull it back, there's a very brittle coupler inside of the VFO. You'll break it and it will ruin your day. All right, there's the access hole I'm talking about. So you take a screwdriver using a flashlight and there's two set screws up there on the coupler that you have to loosen. Once those are loose, you can safely pull off the face. Before I remove the face, let's give this thing a look over. The Navigator is a very rare and collectible radio. It is CW mode only, puts out about 25 watts, runs a single 6146 output tube. Modification wise, I see somebody's added a little eighth inch jack here. We'll investigate that. And of course, it has the new meter installed. Here's the bottom side of the chassis. It looks pretty good nice and clean. Somebody has replaced the main filter caps. And of course I told you about that eighth inch jack. I see a little piece of coax taken off over here. We'll figure that out later. Most important thing is right now is to ensure that it is safe to turn on. There's nothing loose. Everything looks good. All right, I've got the face pulled. I wanted to show you that coupler that I was talking about inside the VFO. It's only accessible from that bottom hole kind of a neat little trick that Johnson did. I have the new switch in place. This is the old one hanging in the breeze. Now the back of this switch does not agree with what you see in the Johnson manual, but it will perform the exact same function. It's a three pole double throw switch. Okay, So I have made a new diagram showing the wiring of the switch and the current shunts for the stock navigator, six and two, and a ranger meter in case you want to use one. 
All right, the first step is to install these jumpers on the back of the switch. You can reference my diagram. Next, I'll be pulling the wiring off of this switch and transferring them over to the right pins on this one. So I'm gonna start by hooking up the plate shunt wires first. Tracing these down below, I see it's the red and black that go to the current shunt resistor. Now this one is a 33 ohm, which was the right one for the navigator, but the wrong one for the six and two meter. So I'm gonna change this shunt. And the proper shunt value for the six and two meter is 0.4 ohms. If you used a ranger meter, it was 0.51 ohms. Whereas the navigator with that crazy meter ahead was 33. So this one won't work. It's got to come out. So I did not have a 0.4 ohm resistor, but I did have two of these 0.2 ohm precision Dale resistors. So I put those in series. That's our new shunt. So the meter switch wiring is complete and I installed the new plate shunt resistors underneath. So before I reassemble, we're actually going to bench test and make sure that this meter is reading correctly. To test the plate meter, I'm going to be utilizing a power supply with a 100 ohm resistor in series. My amp meter is in series with that plate meter, so as I increase this voltage, you should see the meter responding, which it is. There's about 50 mils on the meter. About 100 mils right there. Appears to be pretty accurate. Remember, that's a 50 year old meter. So it's not going to be perfect. My next task is to open up the vernier, clean and lube it. This guy is pretty stiff. I've showed this process in many videos on Johnson Rangers, so you can go back and take a look at that. I'll be utilizing this Deoxit L260D grease for the lubricant in the vernier. All right, the vernier is cleaned and lubed, ready to reinstall. Next step, reassemble the navigator and do a test. So we verify the meter was reading correctly in plate, but what about grid? So I'm going to key the transmitter. You see we have a little over five milliamps showing on the upper scale. But what does my meter back here say? Two and a half. So the meter is too sensitive, which would make it peg out if you want for maximum grid. So I'm gonna have to readjust the scaling on that. So calibrating the grid on this new meter installed in the navigator is a little bit more challenging than what I thought. So in plate, it utilizes that shunt resistor that you saw me install. But in grid, they're actually running the meter in series and there is no shunt. So to solve the sensitivity issue, I had to add a shunt to the grid circuit. Well, the value of that shunt resistor was kind of tricky because of the resistance of the meter. So I added a grid calibration pot. So this is an adjustable shunt value that's in parallel with the meter. And then underneath, I installed a one ohm resistor for monitoring the current. To verify calibration of the grid circuit, I added a one ohm resistor in series with the grid line going to the meter. So you simply clip across that resistor and you're gonna measure millivolts, which equals milliamps, and adjust the meter. Let me show you how that works. So to calibrate the grid meter, I'm in standby, hit the key, you see my grid current on the meter, and you see the millivolts on the multimeter. You simply adjust the pot until the meter reads what you see on the DVM. So I got about 5.5 mils. There it is. Calibrated. You can do the same thing if you use a Ranger meter. You'll see all this on my diagram. I'm going to give the navigator a quick test and then we'll get her back together. Here's my grid. Go to transmit. Of course that drops back. Watch on the meter, the plate, dip it, and we're putting out about 30 watts. Everything looks good. Let's get this front panel together and then I got some other things to do on the back side of the transmitter. 
Backside, I'm going to be removing this eighth inch jack and the coax. I believe it goes into the VFO. And the owner asked me to get rid of this B and C jack and install a nice original Amphenol SO239. Originally, the navigator had a little RCA jack, which was not very robust. So that is why we are replacing it with a good old SO239, just like the Rangers and other transmitters use. I adhered those filter caps to the chassis. Since they're kind of hanging in the breeze, they needed to be supported. Now I'm going to be replacing the missing pointers from these knobs. Normally there's little pointers that stick out the back where they're all gone. And the guy put some paint dots. Well, here's what you can do guys. If these are missing, you can use these. These are made by the Deutsch company. They're for automotive connectors. They're actually pin fillers. You can get these for peanuts and they fit right in those knobs. So what I do is I grind off that head to it fits in the hole. So this is actually the back side of the pin. You put that on there. It looks just like the originals. This is a wrap up on the navigator. I'm doing the final testing before I assemble it. So we're in grid position. Here's my grid drive. Lots of grid drive. Go to plate. Dip my plate. Getting a little over 20 watts out. There's almost 30 watts output right there. Now I have a receiver hooked up in the background. Let's take a listen to the tone and see if there's any chirp. So first, before I go into transmit mode, you can actually hear the VFO. Now we'll transmit. Sounds great.